Chapter One of the Princess Casamassima. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford, Middlebury, Vermont. Princess Casamassima by Henry James. Chapter One. Oh, yes, I dare say I can find the child if you would like to see him, Miss Pinson said. She had a fluttering wish to assent to every suggestion made by her visitor, whom she regarded as a high and rather terrible personage. To look for the little boy she came out of her small parlour, which she had been ashamed to exhibit in so untidy a state, with paper patterns lying about on the furniture, and snippings of stuff scattered over the carpet. She came out of this somewhat stuffy sanctuary, dedicated at once to social intercourse and to the ingenious art to which her life had been devoted, and, opening the house door, turned her eyes up and down the little street. It would presently be tea-time, and she knew that at that solemn hour Hyacinth narrowed the circle of his wanderings. She was anxious and impatient, and in a fever of excitement and complacency, not wanting to keep Mrs. Bowerbank waiting, though she had sat there, heavily and consideringly, as if she meant to stay, and wondering not a little whether the object of her quest would have a dirty face. Mrs. Bowerbank had intimated so definitely that she thought it remarkable on Miss Pinson's part to have taken care of him gratuitously for so many years, that the humble dressmaker, whose imagination took flights about every one but herself, and who had never been conscious of an exemplary benevolence, suddenly aspired to appear throughout as devoted to the child as she had struck her solemn, substantial guest as being, and felt how much she should like to have him come in fresh and frank, and looking as pretty as he sometimes did. Miss Pinsent, who blinked confusedly as she surveyed the outer prospect, was very much flushed, partly with the agitation of what Mrs. Bowerbank had told her, and partly because when she offered that lady a drop of something refreshing, at the end of so long an expedition, she had said she couldn't think of touching anything unless Miss Pinsent would keep her company. The chiffonier, as Amanda was always careful to call it, beside the fireplace, yielded up a small bottle which had formerly contained eau de cologne, and which now exhibited half a pint of a rich gold-coloured liquid. Miss Pinsent was very delicate. She lived on tea and watercress, and she kept the little bottle in the chiffonier only for great emergencies. She didn't like hot brandy and water with a lump or two of sugar, but she partook of half a tumbler on the present occasion, which was of a highly exceptional kind. At this time of day the boy was often planted in front of the little sweet shop on the other side of the street, an establishment where periodical literature as well as tough toffee and hard lollipops was dispensed, and where song-books and pictorial sheets were attractively exhibited in the small-paned, dirty window. He used to stand there for half an hour at a time, spelling out the first page of the romances in the Family Herald and the London Journal, and admiring the obligatory illustration in which the noble characters—they were always of the highest birth— were presented to the carnal eye. When he had a penny he spent only a fraction of it on stale sugar candy. With the remaining halfpenny he always bought a ballad with a vivid woodcut at the top. Now, however, he was not at his post of contemplation, nor was he visible anywhere to Miss Pinson's impatient glance. "'Millicent Henning, tell me quickly, have you seen my child?' These words were addressed by Miss Pinson to a little girl who sat on the doorstep of the adjacent house nursing a dingy doll, and who had an extraordinary luxuriance of dark brown hair surmounted by a torn straw hat. Miss Pinson pronounced her name Enning. The child looked up from her dandling and patting, and after a stare of which the blankness was somewhat exaggerated, replied, "'Law no, Miss Pinson, I never see him.' "'Aren't you always messing around with him, you naughty little girl?' the dressmaker returned with sharpness. "'Isn't he round the corner playing marbles or—or or some jumping game?' Miss Pinsent went on, trying to be suggestive. "'I assure you he never plays nothing,' said Millicent Henning, with a mature manner which she bore out by adding. "'And I don't know why I should be called naughty, neither.' 
Well, if you want to be called good, please go and find him, and tell him there's a lady here come on purpose to see him this very instant. Miss Pinsent waited a moment to see if her injunction would be obeyed, but she got no satisfaction beyond another gaze of deliberation, which made her feel that the child's perversity was as great as the beauty, somewhat soiled and dimmed, of her insolent little face. She turned back into the house with an exclamation of despair, and as soon as she had disappeared, Millicent Henning sprang erect and began to race down the street in the direction of another which crossed it. I take no unfair advantage of the innocence of childhood in saying that the motive of this young lady's flight was not a desire to be agreeable to Miss Pinsent, but an extreme curiosity on the subject of the visitor who wanted to see Hyacinth Robinson. She wished to participate, if only in imagination, in the interview that might take place, and she was moved also by a quick revival of friendly feeling for the boy, from whom she had parted only half an hour before with considerable asperity. She was not a very clinging little creature, and there was no one in her own domestic circle to whom she was much attached. But she liked to kiss Hyacinth when he didn't push her away and tell her she was tiresome. It was in this action and epithet he had indulged half an hour ago, but she had reflected rapidly, while she stared at Miss Pinsent, that this was the worst he had ever done. Millicent Henning was only eight years of age, but she knew there was worse in the world than that. Mrs. Bowerbank, in a leisurely roundabout way, wandered off to her sister, Mrs. Chipperfield, whom she had come into that part of the world to see and the whole history of the dropsical tendencies of whose husband, an undertaker with a business that had been a blessing because you could always count on it, she unfolded to Miss Pinsent between the sips of a second glass. She was a high-shouldered, towering woman, and suggested squareness as well as a pervasion of the upper air, so that Amanda reflected that she must be very difficult to fit, and had a sinking at the idea of the number of pins she would take. Her sister had nine children, and she herself had seven, the eldest of whom she left in charge of the others when she went to her service. She was on duty at the prison only during the day. She had to be there at seven in the morning, but she got her evenings at home, quite regular and comfortable. Miss Pinson thought it wonderful she could talk of comfort in such a life as that, but could easily imagine she should be glad to get away at night, for at that time the place must be much more terrible. "'And aren't you frightened of them, ever?' she inquired, looking up at her visitor with her little heated face. Mrs. Bowerback was very slow, and considered her long before replying that she felt herself to be, in an alarming degree, in the eye of the law, for who could be more closely connected with the administration of justice than a female turnkey, especially so big and majestic a one? "'I expect they are more frightened of me,' she replied at last and it was an idea into which Miss Pinsent could easily enter. "'And at night, I suppose, they rave quite awful,' the little dressmaker suggested, feeling vaguely that prisons and madhouses came to very much the same. "'Well, if they do, we hush em up,' Mrs. Bowerbank remarked, rather portentously, while Miss Pinsent fidgeted to the door again without results, to see if the child had become visible. She observed to her guest that she couldn't call it anything but contrary that he should not turn up when he knew so well most days in the week when his tea was ready. To which Mrs. Bowerbank rejoined, fixing her companion again with the steady orb of justice, "'And do we have his tea that way by himself, like a little gentleman?' "'Well, I try to give it to him tidy-like at a suitable hour,' said Miss Pinsent guiltily. And there might be some who would say that, for the matter of that, he is a little gentleman, she added, with an effort at mitigation which, as she immediately became conscious, only involved her more deeply. There are people silly enough to say anything. If it's your parents that settle your station, the child hasn't much to be thankful for, Mrs. Bowerbank went on, in the manner of a woman accustomed to looking facts in the face. Miss Pinsent was very timid, but she adored the aristocracy and there were elements in the boy's life which he was not prepared to sacrifice even to a person who represented such a possibility of grating bolts and clanking chains. I suppose we oughtn't to forget that his father was very high, she suggested appealingly, 
with her hands clasped tightly in her lap. "'His father? Who knows who he was? He doesn't sit up for having a father, does he?' "'But surely wasn't it proved that Lord Frederick—' "'My dear woman, nothing was proved, except that she stabbed his lordship in the back with a very long knife, that he died of the blow, and that she got the full sentence. When does such a piece as that know about fathers? The less said about the poor child's ancestors, the better.' This view of the case caused Miss Pinson fairly to gasp, for it pushed over with a touch a certain tall imaginative structure which she had been piling up for years. Even as she heard it crash around her, she couldn't forbear the attempt to save at least some of the material. Really, really, she panted, she never had to do with any one but the nobility. Mrs. Bowerbank surveyed her hostess with an expressionless eye. My dear young lady, what does a respectable little body like you, that sits all day with her needle and scissors, know about the doings of a wicked low foreigner that carries a knife? I was there when she came in, and I know to what she had sunk. Her conversation was choice, I assure you. Oh, it's very dreadful, and of course I know nothing in particular, Miss Pinson quavered. But she wasn't low when I worked at the same place with her, and she often told me she would do nothing for any one that wasn't at the very top. She might have talked to you of something that would have done you both more good, Mrs. Bowerbank remarked while the dressmaker felt rebuked in the past as well as in the present. At the very top, poor thing. Well, she's at the very bottom now. If she wasn't low when she worked, it's a pity she didn't stick to her work. And as for pride of birth, that's an article I recommend your young friend to leave to others. You had better believe what I say, because I'm a woman of the world. Indeed she was, as Miss Pinson felt, to whom all this was very terrible, letting in the cold light of the penal system on a dear, dim little theory. She had cared for the child because maternity was in her nature, and this was the only manner in which fortune had put it in her path to become a mother. She had as few belongings as the baby, and it had seemed to her that he would add to her importance in the little world of Lomax Place, if she kept it a secret how she came by him, quite in the proportion in which she should contribute to his maintenance. Her weakness and loneliness went out to his, and in the course of time this united desolation was peopled by the dressmaker's romantic mind with a hundred consoling evocations. The boy proved neither a dunce nor a reprobate, but what endeared him to her most was her conviction that he belonged, by the left hand, as she had read in a novel, to an ancient and exalted race, the list of whose representatives and the record of whose alliances she had once, when she took home some work and was made to wait alone in a lady's boudoir, had the opportunity of reading in a fat red book, eagerly and tremblingly consulted. She bent her head before Mrs. Bowerbank's overwhelming logic, but she felt in her heart that she shouldn't give the child up for all that, that she believed in him still, and that she recognized, as distinctly as she revered, the quality of her betters. To believe in Hyacinth, for Miss Pinsent, was to believe that he was the son of the extremely immoral Lord Frederick. She had from his earliest age made him feel that there was a grandeur in his past, and as Mrs. Bowerbank would be sure not to approve of such aberrations, Miss Pinsent prayed she might not question her on that part of the business. It was not that, when it was necessary, the little dressmaker had any scruple about using the arts of prevarication. She was a kind and innocent creature, but she told fibs as freely as she invented trimmings. She had, however, not yet been questioned by an emissary of the law, and her heart beat faster when Mrs. Bowerbank said to her, in deep tones, with an effect of abruptness, "'And pray, Miss Pinsent, does the child know it?' "'Know about Lord Frederick?' Miss Pinson palpitated. "'Bother Lord Frederick! Know about his mother!' "'Oh, I can't say that. I have never told him.' "'But has any one else told him?' To this inquiry Miss Pinson's answer was more prompt and more proud. It was with an agreeable sense of having conducted herself with extraordinary wisdom and propriety that she replied, "'How could any one know? I have never breathed it to a creature.' Miss Bowerbank gave utterance to no commendation. She only put down her empty glass and wiped her large mouth 
with much thoroughness and deliberation. Then she said, as if it were as cheerful an idea as, in the premises, she was capable of expressing, Ah, well, there'll be plenty later on to give him all information. I pray God he may live and die without knowing it, Miss Pinson cried with eagerness. Her companion gazed at her with a kind of professional patience. You don't keep your ideas together. How can he go to her, then, if he's never to know? Oh, did you mean she would tell him? Miss Pinson responded plaintively. Tell him? He won't need to be told once she gets hold of him and gives him what she told me. What she told you? Miss Pinson repeated, open-eyed. The kiss her lips have been famished for for years. Ah, poor desolate woman, the little dressmaker murmured, with her pity gushing up again. Of course he'll see she's fond of him, she pursued simply. Then she added, with an inspiration more brilliant, We might tell him she's his aunt. You may tell him she's his grandmother, if you like. But it's all in the family. Yes, on that side, said Miss Pinsent, musingly and irrepressibly. And will she speak French, she inquired. In that case he won't understand. Oh, a child will understand its own mother whatever she speaks, Mrs. Bowerbank returned, declining to administer a superficial comfort. But she subjoined, opening the door for escape, from a prospect which bristled with dangers. Of course it's just according to your own conscience. You needn't bring the child at all unless you like. There's many a one that wouldn't. There's no compulsion. And would nothing be done to me if I didn't? Poor Miss Pinsent asked, unable to rid herself of the impression that it was somehow the arm of the law that was stretched out to touch her. The only thing that could happen to you would be that he might throw it up against you later, the lady from the prison observed, with a gloomy impartiality. Yes, indeed, if he were to know that I had kept him back. Oh, he'd be sure to know one of these days. We see a great deal of that. The way things come out, said Mrs. Bowerbank, whose view of life seemed to abound in cheerless contingencies. You must remember that it is her dying wish, and that you may have it on your conscience. That's a thing I could never abide, the little dressmaker exclaimed, with great emphasis and a visible shiver, after which she picked up various scattered remnants of muslin and cut-up paper, and began to roll them together with a desperate and mechanical haste. It's quite awful to know what to do, if you are very sure she is dying. Do you mean she's shamming? We have plenty of that, but we know how to treat em. Lord, I suppose so, murmured Miss Pinsent, while her visitor went on to say that the unfortunate person, on whose behalf she had undertaken this solemn pilgrimage, might live a week and might live a fortnight, but if she lived a month it would violate, as Mrs. Bowerbank might express herself, every established law of nature, being reduced to skin and bone, with nothing left of her but the main desire to see her child. If you're afraid of her talking, it isn't much she'd be able to say, and we shouldn't allow you more than about eight minutes, Mrs. Bowerbank pursued, in a tone that seemed to refer itself to an iron discipline. I'm sure I shouldn't want more. That would be enough to last me many a year, said Miss Pinsent, accommodatingly. And then she added, with another illumination, Don't you think he might throw it up against me that I did take him? People might tell him about her in later years, but if he hadn't seen her he wouldn't be obliged to believe them. Mrs. Bowerbank considered this a moment, as if it were rather a super-subtle argument, and then answered, quite in the spirit of her official pessimism, There is one thing you may be sure of, whatever you decide to do, as soon as ever he grows up, he will make you wish you had done the opposite. Mrs. Bowerbank called it opposite. Oh, dear, then, I'm glad it will be a long time. It will be ever so long if once he gets it into his head. At any rate, you must do as you think best. Only, if you come, you mustn't come when it's all over. It's too impossible to decide. It is indeed, said Mrs. Bowerbank, with superior consistency and she seemed more placidly grim than ever when she remarked, gathering up her loosened shawl, that she was much obliged to Miss Pinson for her civility, and had been quite freshened up. Her visit had so completely deprived her hostess of that sort of calm. Miss Pinson gave the fullest expression to her perplexity in the supreme exclamation. 
if only you could wait and see the child i'm sure it would help you to judge my dear woman i don't want to judge it's none of our business mrs bowerbank exclaimed and she had no sooner uttered the words than the door of the room creaked open and a small boy stood there gazing at her her eyes rested on him a moment and then most unexpectedly she gave an inconsequent cry is that the child oh lord a mercy don't take him now ain't he shrinking and sensitive demanded miss pinsent who had pounced upon him and holding him an instant at arm's length appealed eagerly to her visitor ain't he delicate and high-bred and wouldn't he be thrown into a state delicate as he might be the little dressmaker shook him smartly for his naughtiness in being out of the way when he was wanted and brought him to the big square-faced deep-voiced lady who took up as it were all that side of the room but mrs bowerbank laid no hand on him she only dropped her gaze from a tremendous height and her forbearance seemed a tribute to that fragility of constitution on which miss pinsent desired to insist just as her continued gravity was an implication that this scrupulous woman might well not know what to do speak to the lady nicely and tell her you are very sorry to have kept her waiting the child hesitated a moment while he reciprocated mrs bowerbank's inspection and then he said with a strange cool conscious indifference miss pinsent instantly recognized it as his aristocratic manner i don't think she can have been in a very great hurry there was irony in the words for it is a remarkable fact that even at the age of ten hyacinth robinson was ironical but the subject of his illusion who was not nimble-witted appeared not to interpret it so that she rejoined only by remarking over his head to miss pinsent it's the very face of her over again of her but what do you say to lord frederick i have seen lords that wasn't so dainty miss pinsent had seen very few lords but she entered with a passionate thrill into this generalization controlling herself however for she remembered the child was tremendously sharp sufficiently to declare in an edifying tone that he would look more like what he ought to if his face were a little cleaner it was probably millicent henning dirtied my face when she kissed me the boy announced with slow gravity looking all the while at mrs bowerbank he exhibited not a symptom of shyness millicent henning is a very bad little girl she'll come for no good said miss pinsent with familiar decision and also considering that the young lady in question had been her effective messenger with marked ingratitude against this qualification the child instantly protested why is she bad i don't think she is bad i like her very much it came over him that he had too hastily shifted to her shoulders the responsibility of his unseemly appearance and he wished to make up to her for that betrayal he dimly felt that nothing but that particular accusation could have pushed him to it for he hated people who were not fresh who had smutches and streaks millicent henning generally had two or three which she borrowed from her doll into whom she was always rubbing her nose and whose dinginess was contagious it was quite inevitable she should have left her mark under his own nose when she claimed her reward for coming to tell him about the lady who wanted him miss pitson held the boy against her knee trying to present him so that mrs bowerbank should agree with her about his having the air of race he was exceedingly diminutive even for his years and though his appearance was not positively sickly it seemed written in his attenuated little person that he would never be either tall or strong his dark blue eyes were separated by a wide interval which increased the fairness and sweetness of his face and his abundant curly hair which grew thick and long had the golden brownness predestined to elicit exclamations of delight from ladies when they take the inventory of a child his features were smooth and pretty his head was set upon a slim little neck his expression grave and clear showed a quick perception as well as a great credulity and he was altogether in his innocent smallness a refined and interesting figure yes he's one that would be sure to remember said mrs bowerbank 
mentally contrasting him with the undeveloped members of her own brood, who had never been retentive of anything but the halfpence which they occasionally contrived to filch from her. Her eyes descended to the details of his toilet, the careful mending of his short breeches, and his long coloured stockings, which he was in a position to appreciate, as well as the knot of bright ribbon which the dressmaker had passed into his collar, slightly crumpled by Miss Henning's embrace. Of course Miss Pinsent had only one to look after, but her visitor was obliged to recognise that she had the highest standard in respect to buttons. "'And you do turn em out, so it's a pleasure,' she went on, noting the ingenious patches in the child's shoes, which to her mind were repaired for all the world like those of a little nobleman. "'I'm sure you're very civil,' said Miss Pinsent, in a state of some exaltation. "'There's never a needle but mine has come near him. That's exactly what I think. The impression would go so deep.' "'Do you want to see me only to look at me?' Hyacinth inquired, with a candour which, though unstudied, had again much of the force of satire. "'I'm sure it's very kind of the lady to notice you at all,' cried his protectress, giving him an ineffectual jerk. "'You're no bigger than a flea. There are many that wouldn't spy you out.' "'You'll find he's big enough, I expect, when he begins to go,' Mrs. Bowerbank remarked tranquilly, and she added that now she saw how he was turned out, she couldn't but feel that the other side was to be considered. In her effort to be discreet, on account of his being present, and so precociously attentive, she became slightly enigmatical, but Miss Pinsent gathered her meaning, which was that it was very true the child would take everything in and keep it. But at the same time it was precisely his being so attractive that made it a kind of sin not to gratify the poor woman, who, if she knew what he looked like to-day, wouldn't forgive his adoptive mamma for not producing him. "'Certainly in her place I should go off easier if I had seen them curls,' Mrs. Bowerbank declared, with a flight of maternal imagination which brought her to her feet, while Miss Pinson felt that she was leaving her dreadfully ploughed up, and without any really fertilising seed having been sown. The little dressmaker packed the child upstairs to tidy himself for his tea, and while she accompanied her visitor to the door, told her that if she would have a little more patience with her, she would think a day or two longer what was best, and write to her when she should have decided. Mrs. Bowerbank continued to move in a realm superior to poor Miss Pinston's vacillations and timidities, and her impartiality gave her hostess a high idea of her respectability. But the way was a little smoothed, when after Amanda had moaned once more on the threshold, helplessly and irrelevantly, "'Ain't it a pity she's so bad?' the ponderous lady from the prison rejoined, in those tones which seemed meant to resound through corridors of stone, "'I assure you there's a many that's much worse.'" End of chapter 1「Miss Pinsent, when she found herself alone, felt that she was really quite upside down, for the event that had just occurred had never entered into her calculations. The very nature of the case had seemed to preclude it. All she knew, and all she wished to know, was that in one of the dreadful institutions constructed for such purposes, her quondam comrade was serving out the sentence that had been substituted for the other, the unspeakable horror, almost when the halter was already round her neck. As there was no question of that concession being stretched any further, poor Florentine seemed only a little more dead than other people, having no decent tombstone to mark the place where she lay. Miss Pinson had therefore never thought of her dying again. She had no idea to what prison she had been committed on being removed from Newgate. She wished to keep her mind a blank about the matter in the interest of the child. And it could not occur to her that out of such silence and darkness a second voice would reach her, especially a voice that she should really have to listen to. Miss Pinson would have said, before Mrs. Bowerbank's visit, that she had no account to render to any one, that she had taken up the child, who might have starved in the gutter, out of charity, 
and had brought him up poor and precarious as her own subsistence had been without a penny's help from another source that the mother had forfeited every right and title and that this had been understood between them if anything in so dreadful an hour could have been said to be understood when she went to see her at newgate that terrible episode nine years before overshadowed all miss pinson's other memories went to see her because florentine had sent for her a name face and address coming up out of the still recent but sharply separated past of their working girl years as the one friend to whom she could appeal with some chance of a pitying answer the effect of violent emotion with miss pinson was not to make her sit with idle hands or fidget about to no purpose under its influence on the contrary she threw herself into little jobs as a fugitive takes to buy paths and clipped and cut and stitched and basted as if she were running a race with hysterics and while her hands her scissors her needle flew an infinite succession of fantastic probabilities trotted through her confused little head she had a furious imagination and the act of reflection in her mind was always a panorama of figures and scenes she had had her picture of the future painted in rather rosy hues hung up before her now for a good many years but it seemed to her that mrs bowerbank's heavy hand had suddenly punched a hole in the canvas it must be added however that if amanda's thoughts were apt to be bewildering visions they sometimes led her to make up her mind and on this particular september evening she arrived at a momentous decision what she had made up her mind to was to take advice and in pursuance of this view she rushed downstairs and jerking hyacinth away from his simple but unfinished repast packed him across the street to tell mr vetch if he had not yet started for the theatre that she begged he would come in to see her when he came home that night as she had something very particular she wished to say to him it didn't matter if he should be very late he could come in at any hour he would see her light in the window and he would do her a real mercy miss pinsent knew it would be of no use for her to go to bed she felt as if she should never close her eyes again mr vench was her most distinguished friend she had an immense appreciation of his cleverness and knowledge of the world as well as of the purity of his taste in matters of conduct and opinion and she had already consulted him about hyacinth's education the boy needed no urging to go on such an errand for he too had his ideas about the little fiddler the second violin in the orchestra of the bloomsbury theatre mr vetch had once obtained for the pair an order for two seats at a pantomime and for hyacinth the impression of that ecstatic evening had consecrated him placed him for ever in the golden glow of the footlights there were things in life of which even at the age of ten it was a conviction of the boys that it would be his fate never to see enough and one of them was the wonder world illuminated by those playhouse lamps but there would be chances perhaps if one didn't lose sight of mr vetch he might open the door again he was a privileged magical mortal who went to the play every night he came in to see miss pinson about midnight as soon as she heard the lame tinkle of the bell she went to the door to let him in he was an original in the fullest sense of the word a lonely disappointed embittered cynical little man whose musical organization had been sterile who had the nerves the sensibilities of a gentleman and whose fate had condemned him for the last ten years to play a fiddle at a second-rate theatre for a few shillings a week he had ideas of his own about everything and they were not always very improving for amanda pinsent he represented art literature the literature of the playbill and philosophy and she always felt about him as if he belonged to a higher social sphere though his earnings were hardly greater than her own and he lived in a single back room in a house where she had never seen a window washed he had for her the glamour of reduced gentility and fallen fortunes she was conscious that he spoke a different language though she couldn't have said in what the difference consisted from the other members of her humble almost suburban circle and the shape of his hands was distinctly aristocratic miss pinsent as i have intimated was immensely preoccupied with that element in life 
Mr. Vetch displeased her only by one of the facets of his character, his blasphemous Republican radical views, and the contemptuous manner in which he expressed himself about the nobility. On that ground he worried her extremely, though he never seemed to her so clever as when he horrified her most. These dreadful theories, expressed so brilliantly that really they might have been dangerous if Miss Pinsent had not known her own place so well, constituted no presumption against his refined origin. They were explained rather to a certain extent by a just resentment at finding himself excluded from his proper place. Mr. Vetch was short, fat, and bald, though he was not much older than Miss Pinsent, who was not much older than some people who called themselves forty-five. He always went to the theatre in evening dress with a flower in his buttonhole, and wore a glass in one eye. He looked placid and genial, and as if he would fidget at the most about the get-up of his linen. You would have thought him finical but superficial, and never have suspected that he was a revolutionist or even a critic of life. Sometimes, when he could get away from the theatre early enough, he went with a pianist, a friend of his, to play dance music at small parties, and after such expeditions he was particularly cynical and startling. He indulged in diatribes against the British middle class, its philistinism, its snobbery. He seldom had much conversation with Miss Pinson without telling her that she had the intellectual outlook of a caterpillar. But this was his privilege after a friendship now of seven years' standing, which had begun, the year after he came to live in Lomax Place, with her going over to nurse him, on learning from the milkwoman that he was alone at number seventeen, laid up with an attack of gastritis. He always compared her to an insect or a bird, and she didn't mind, because she knew he liked her, and she herself liked all winged creatures. How indeed could she complain, after hearing him call the Queen a superannuated form, and the Archbishop of Canterbury a grotesque superstition? He laid his violin case on the table, which was covered with a confusion of fashion plates and pincushions, and glanced toward the fire, where a kettle was gently hissing. Miss Pinsent, who had put it on half an hour before, read his glance and reflected with complacency that Mrs. Bowerbank had not absolutely drained the little bottle in the chiffonier. She placed it on the table again, this time with a single glass, and told her visitor that as a great exception he might light his pipe. In fact, she always made the exception, and he always replied to the gracious speech by inquiring whether she supposed the greengrocers' wives, the butchers' daughters for whom she worked, had fine enough noses to smell, in the garments she sent home, the fumes of his tobacco. He knew her connection was confined to small shopkeepers, but she didn't wish others to know it, and would have liked them to believe it was important that the poor little stuffs she made up, into very queer fashions, I am afraid, should not surprise the feminine nostril. But it had always been impossible to impose on Mr. Vetch. He guessed the truth, the untrimmed truth, about everything in a moment. She was sure he would do so now, in regard to this solemn question which had come up about Hyacinth. He would see that though she was agreeably flurried at finding herself whirled in the last eddies of a case that had been so celebrated in its day, her secret wish was to shirk her duty, if it was a duty, to keep the child from ever knowing his mother's unmentionable history, the shame that attached to his origin, the opportunity she had had of letting him see the wretched woman before she died. She knew Mr. Vetch would read her troubled thoughts, but she hoped he would say that they were natural and just. She reflected that as he took an interest in Hyacinth, he wouldn't desire him to be subjected to a mortification that might rankle for ever and perhaps even crush him to the earth. She related Mrs. Bowerbank's visit while he sat upon the sofa in the very place where that majestic woman had reposed, and puffed his smoke-wreaths into the dusky little room. He knew the story of the child's birth, had known it years before, so she had no startling revelation to make. He was not in the least agitated at learning that Florentine was dying in prison, and had managed to get a message conveyed to Amanda. He thought this so much in the usual course that he said to Miss Pinsent, 
Did you expect her to live on there for ever, working out her terrible sentence, just to spare you the annoyance of a dilemma, or any reminder of her miserable existence, which you have preferred to forget? That was just the sort of question Mr. Vetch was sure to ask, and he inquired further of his dismayed hostess whether she was sure her friend's message—he called the unhappy creature her friend—had come to her in the regular way. The warders, surely, had no authority to introduce visitors to their captives, and was it a question of her going off to the prison on the sole authority of Mrs. Bowerbank? The little dressmaker explained that this lady had merely come to sound her. Florentine had begged so hard. She had been in Mrs. Bowerbank's ward before her removal to the infirmary, where she now lay ebbing away, and she had communicated her desire to the Catholic chaplain, who had undertaken that some satisfaction, of inquiry at least, should be given her. He had thought it best to ascertain first whether the person in charge of the child would be willing to bring him, such a course being perfectly optional, and he had some talk with Mrs. Bowerbank on the subject, in which it was agreed between them that she would approach Miss Pincent and explain to her the situation, leaving her to do what she thought best. He would answer for it that the consent of the governor of the prison should be given to the interview. Miss Pincent had lived for fourteen years in Lomax Place, and Florentine had never forgotten that this was her address at the time she came to her at Newgate, before her dreadful sentence had been commuted, and promised, in an outgush of pity, for one whom she had known in the days of her honesty and brightness, that she would save the child, rescue it from the workhouse and the streets, keep it from the fate that had swallowed up the mother. Mrs. Bowerbank had a half-holiday, and a sister living also in the north of London, to whom she had been for some time intending a visit, so that after her domestic duty had been performed, it had been possible for her to drop in on Miss Pinsent in a natural, casual way, and put the case before her. It would be just as she might be disposed to view it. She was to think it over a day or two, but not long, because the woman was so ill, and then write to Mrs. Bowerbank at the prison. If she should consent, Mrs. Bowerbank would tell the chaplain, and the chaplain would obtain the order from the governor and send it to Lomax Place, after which Amanda would immediately set out with her unconscious victim. But should she, must she, consent? That was the terrible, the heart-shaking question with which Miss Pinson's unaided wisdom had been unable to grapple. After all, he isn't hers any more. He's mine, mine only, and mine always. I should like to know if all I have done for him doesn't make him so. It was in this manner that Amanda Pinson delivered herself while she plied her needle faster than ever in a piece of stuff that was pinned to her knee. Mr. Vetch watched her a while, blowing silently at his pipe, with his head thrown back on the high, stiff, old-fashioned sofa, and his little legs crossed under him like a Turk's. It's true you have done a good deal for him. You are a good little woman, my dear Pinny, after all. He said, after all, because that was a part of his tone. In reality, he had never had a moment's doubt that she was the best little woman in the north of London. I have done what I could, and I don't want no fuss made about it. Only it does make a difference when you come to look at it, about taking him off to see another woman, and such another woman, and in such a place. I think it's hardly right to take an innocent child. I don't know about that. There are people that would tell you it would do him good. If he didn't like the place as a child, he would take more care to keep out of it later. Lord, Mr. Vetch, how can you think? And him such a perfect little gentleman, Miss Pinson cried. Is it you that have made him one? the fiddler asked. It doesn't run in the family, you'd say. Family? What do you know about that? she replied quickly, catching at her dearest, her only hobby. Yes, indeed, what does any one know? What did she know herself? And then Miss Pinson's visitor added irrelevantly, Why should you have taken him on your back? Why did you want to be so good? No one else thinks it's necessary. I didn't want to be good. That is, I do want to, of course, in a general way, but that wasn't the reason then. But I had nothing of my own. 
I had nothing in the world but my thimble. That would have seemed to most people a reason for not adopting a prostitute's bastard. Well, I went to see him at the place where he was, just where she had left him, with the woman of the house, and I saw what kind of a shop that was, and I felt it was a shame an innocent child should grow up in such a place. Miss Pinsent defended herself as earnestly as if her inconsistency had been of a criminal cast. And he wouldn't have grown up neither. They wouldn't have troubled themselves long with a helpless baby. They'd have played some trick on him, if it was only to send him to the workhouse. Besides, I was always fond of tiny creatures, and I have been fond of this one, she went on, speaking as if with a consciousness, on her own part, of almost heroic proportions. He was in my way the first two or three years, and it was a good deal of a pull to look after the business and him together. But now he's like the business. He seems to go of himself. Oh, if he flourishes as the business flourishes, you can just enjoy your peace of mind, said the fiddler, still with his manner of making a small dry joke of everything. That's all very well, but it doesn't close my eyes to that poor woman lying there and moaning just for the touch of his little, and before she passes away. Mrs. Bowerbank says she believes I will bring him. Who believes? Mrs. Bowerbank? I wonder if there's anything in life holy enough for you to take it seriously, Miss Pinsent rejoined, snapping off a thread with temper. The day you stop laughing, I should like to be there. So long as you are there, I shall never stop. What is it you want me to advise you? To take the child, or to leave the mother to groan herself out? I want you to tell me whether he'll curse me when he grows older. That depends upon what you do. However, he will probably do it in either case. You don't believe that because you like him, said Amanda, with acuteness. Precisely, and he'll curse me too. He'll curse everyone. He won't be happy. I don't know how you think I bring him up, the little dressmaker remarked with dignity. You don't bring him up. He brings you up. That's what you have always said, but you don't know. If you mean that he does as he likes, then he ought to be happy. It ain't kind of you to say he won't be, Miss Pinsent added reproachfully. I would say anything you like, if what I say would help the matter. He's a thin-skinned, morbid, mooning little beggar, with a good deal of imagination and not much perseverance, who will expect a good deal more of life than he will find in it. That's why he won't be happy. Miss Pinsent listened to this description of her protégé with an appearance of criticizing it mentally, but in reality she didn't know what morbid meant and didn't like to ask. "'He's the cleverest person I know except yourself,' she said in a moment, for Mr. Vetch's words had been in the key of what she thought most remarkable in him. What that was she would have been unable to say. "'Thank you very much for putting me first, the fiddler rejoined, after a series of puffs. The youngster is interesting, one sees that he has a mind, and in that respect he is, I won't say unique, but peculiar. I shall watch him with curiosity to see what he grows into. But I shall always be glad that I am a selfish brute of a bachelor, that I never invested in that class of goods. Well, you are comforting. You would spoil him more than I do, said Amanda. Possibly, but it would be in a different way. I wouldn't tell him every three minutes that his father was a duke. A duke I never mentioned, the little dressmaker cried with eagerness. I never specified any rank, nor said a word about any one in particular. I never so much as insinuated the name of his lordship. But I may have said that if the truth was to be found out, he might be proved to be connected, in the way of cousinship or something of the kind with the highest in the land. I should have thought myself wanting if I hadn't given him a glimpse of that. But there is one thing I have always added, that the truth never is found out. "'You are still more comforting than I,' Mr. Vetch exclaimed. He continued to watch her with his charitable, round-faced smile, and then he said, "'You won't do what I say, so what is the use of my telling you?' "'I assure you I will.' If you say you believe it's the only right. Do I often say anything so asinine? Right, right? 
What have you to do with that? If you want the only right, you are very particular. Please, then, what am I to go by? the dressmaker asked, bewildered. You are to go by this, by what will take the youngster down. Take him down, my poor little pet? Your poor little pet thinks himself the flower of creation. I don't say there is any harm in that. A fine, blooming, odoriferous conceit is a natural appendage of youth and cleverness. I don't say there is any great harm in it, but if you want a guide as to how you are to treat a boy, that's as good a guide as any other. You want me to arrange the interview, then? I don't want you to do anything but give me another sip of brandy. I just say this, that I think it's a great gain early in life to know the worst. Then we don't live in a fool's paradise. I did that till I was nearly forty. Then I woke up and found I was in Lomax Place. Whenever Mr. Vetch said anything that could be construed as a reference to a former position, which had had elements of distinction, Miss Pinsent observed a respectful, a tasteful silence, and that is why she did not challenge him now, though she wanted very much to say that Hyacinth was no more presumptuous, that was the term she should have used, than he had reason to be, with his genteel figure and his wonderful intelligence, and that as for thinking himself a flower of any kind, he knew but too well that he lived in a small, black-faced house, miles away from the West End, rented by a poor little woman who took lodgers, and who, as they were of such a class that they were not always to be depended upon to settle her weekly account, had a strain to make two ends meet, in spite of the sign between her windows, Miss Amanda Pinsent, mode et robe, dressmaking in all its branches, court dresses, mantles, and fashionable bonnets. Singularly enough, her companion, before she had permitted herself to interpose, took up her own thought in one of its parts, and remarked that perhaps she would say of the child that he was, so far as his actual circumstances were concerned, low enough down in the world without one's wanting him to be any lower. But by the time he's twenty, he'll persuade himself that Lomax Place was a bad dream, that your lodgers and your dressmaking were as imaginary as they are vulgar, and that when an old friend came to see you late at night, it was not your amiable practice to make him a glass of brandy and water. He'll teach himself to forget all this. He'll have a way. Do you mean he'll forget me? He'll deny me? cried Miss Pinsent, stopping the movement of her needle short off for the first time. As the person designated in that attractive blazonry on the outside of your house, decidedly he will, and me equally as a bald-headed, pot-bellied fiddler, who regarded you as the most graceful and refined of his acquaintance. I don't mean he'll disown you and pretend he never knew you. I don't think he will ever be such an odious little cad as that. He probably won't be a sneak, and he strikes me as having some love, and possibly even some gratitude in him. But he will, in his imagination, and that will always persuade him, subject you to some extraordinary metamorphosis. He will dress you up. He'll dress me up, Amanda ejaculated, quite ceasing to follow the train of Mr. Vetch's demonstration. Do you mean that he'll have the property, that his relations will take him up? My dear, delightful, idiotic Penny, I am speaking in a figurative manner. I don't pretend to say what his precise position will be when we are relegated, but I affirm that relegation will be our fate. Therefore, don't stuff him with any more illusions than are necessary to keep him alive. He will be sure to pick up enough on the way. On the contrary, give him a good stiff dose of the truth at the start. "'Dear me, dear me, of course you see much further into it than I ever do,' Pinny murmured as she threaded a needle. Mr. Vetch paused a minute, but apparently not out of deference to this amiable interruption. He went on suddenly, with a ring of feeling in his voice. "'Let him know, because it will be useful to him later, the state of the account between society and himself. He can then conduct himself accordingly.' If he is the illegitimate child of a French good-for-naught who murdered one of her numerous lovers, don't shuffle out of sight so important a fact, 
I regard that as the most valuable origin. Lord, Mr. Vetch, how you talk! cried Miss Pinson, staring. I don't know what one would think to hear you. Surely, my dear lady, and for this reason, that those are the people with whom society has to count. It hasn't with you and me. Miss Pinson gave a sigh, which might have meant either that she was well aware of that, or that Mr. Vetch had a terrible way of enlarging a subject, especially when it was already too big for her. And her philosophic visitor went on, Poor little devil, let him see her, let him see her. And if later when he's twenty he says to me that if I hadn't meddled in it he need never have known, he need never have had that shame, pray what am I to say to him then? That's what I can't get out of my head. You can say to him that a young man who is sorry for having gone up to his mother when, in her last hours, she lay groaning for him on a pallet in a penitentiary, deserves more than the sharpest pang he can possibly feel. And the little fiddler, getting up, went over to the fireplace and shook out the ashes of his pipe. "'Well, I am sure it's natural he should feel badly,' said Miss Pinsent, folding up her work with the same desperate quickness that had animated her throughout the evening. "'I haven't the least objection to his feeling badly. That's not the worst thing in the world. If a few more people felt badly, in this sodden, stolid, stupid race of ours, the world would wake up to an idea or two, and we should see the beginning of the dance. It's the dull acceptance, the absence of reflection, the impenetrable density. Here Mr. Vetch stopped short. His hostess stood before him with eyes of entreaty, with clasped hands. Now, Anastasius Vetch, don't go off into them dreadful wild theories, she cried, always ungrammatical when she was strongly moved. You always fly away over the housetops. I thought you liked him better, the dear little unfortunate. Anastasius Vetch had pocketed his pipe. He put on his hat with the freedom of old acquaintance and of Lomax Place, and took up his small, coffin-like fiddle-case. My good Penny, I don't think you understand a word I say. It's no use talking. Do as you like. Well, I must say, I don't think it was worth your coming in at midnight only to tell me that. I don't like anything. I hate the whole dreadful business. He bent over, in his short plumpness, to kiss her hand, as he had seen people do on the stage. My dear friend, we have different ideas, and I shall never succeed in driving mine into your head. It's because I am fond of him, poor little devil, but you will never understand that. I want him to know everything, and especially the worst, the worst, as I have said. If I were in his position, I shouldn't thank you for trying to make a fool of me. A fool of you? And if I thought of anything but his happiness, Amanda Pinsent exclaimed. She stood looking at him, but following her own reflections. She had given up the attempt to enter into his whims. She remembered what she had noticed before in other occurrences, that his reasons were always more extraordinary than his behaviour itself. If you only considered his life, you wouldn't have thought him so fanciful. Very likely, I think too much of that, she added. She wants him and cries for him. That's what keeps coming back to me. She took up her lamp to light Mr. Vetch to the door, for the dim luminary in the passage had long since been extinguished, and before he left the house he turned, suddenly, stopping short, and said, his composed face taking a strange expression from the quizzical glimmer of his little round eyes, "'What does it matter after all, and why do you worry? What difference can it make what happens on either side to such low people?' End of chapter 2《Mrs. Bowerbank had let her know she would meet her almost at the threshold of the dreadful place, and this thought had sustained Miss Pinsent in her long and devious journey, performed partly on foot, partly in a succession of omnibuses. She had had ideas about a cab, but she decided to reserve the cab for the return 
as then, very likely, she should be so shaken with emotion, so overpoweringly affected, that it would be a comfort to escape from observation. She had no confidence that if once she passed the door of the prison she should ever be restored to liberty and her customers. It seemed to her an adventure as dangerous as it was dismal, and she was immensely touched by the clear-faced eagerness of the child at her side, who strained forward as brightly as he had done on another occasion, still celebrated in Miss Pinson's industrious annals, a certain sultry Saturday in August when she had taken him to the tower. It had been a terrible question with her, when once she made up her mind, what she should tell him about the nature of their errand. She determined to tell him as little as possible, to say only that she was going to see a poor woman who was in prison on account of a crime she had committed years before, and who had sent for her, and caused her to be told at the same time that if there was any child she could see, as children, if they were very good, were bright and cheering, it would make her very happy that such a little visitor should come as well. It was very difficult with Hyacinth to make reservations or mysteries. He wanted to know everything about everything, and he projected the light of a hundred questions upon Miss Pinson's incarcerated friend. She had to admit that she had been her friend, for where else was the obligation to go to see her? But she spoke of the acquaintance as if it were of the slightest it had survived in the memory of the prisoner only because every one else, the world was so very hard, had turned away from her. And she congratulated herself on a happy inspiration when she represented the crime for which such a penalty had been exacted as the theft of a gold watch in a moment of irresistible temptation. The woman had had a wicked husband who maltreated her and deserted her, and she was very poor, almost starving, dreadfully pressed. Hyacinth listened to her story with absorbed attention, and then he said, "'And hadn't she any children? Hadn't she a little boy?' This inquiry seemed to Miss Pinsent a portent of future embarrassments, but she met it as bravely as she could, and replied that she believed the wretched victim of the law had had, once upon a time, a very small baby, but she was afraid she had completely lost sight of it. He must know they didn't allow babies in prisons. To this Hyacinth rejoined that of course they would allow him, because he was, really, big. Miss Pinsent fortified herself with the memory of her other pilgrimage to Newgate, upwards of ten years before. She had escaped from that ordeal, and had even had the comfort of knowing that in its fruits the interview had been beneficent. The responsibility, however, was much greater now and after all it was not on her own account she was in a nervous tremor, but on that of the urchin over whom the shadow of the house of shame might cast itself. They made the last part of their approach on foot, having got themselves deposited as near as possible to the river, and keeping beside it, according to advice elicited by Miss Pinsent on the way, in a dozen confidential interviews with policemen, conductors of omnibuses, and small shopkeepers, till they came to a big, dark building with towers, which they would know as soon as they looked at it. They knew it, in fact, soon enough, when they saw it lift its dusky mass from the bank of the Thames, lying there and sprawling over the whole neighbourhood with brown, bare, windowless walls, ugly, truncated pinnacles, and a character unspeakably sad and stern. It looked very sinister and wicked to Miss Pinson's eyes, and she wondered why a prison should have such an evil face if it was erected in the interest of justice and order, an expression of the righteous forces of society. This particular penitentiary struck her as about as bad and wrong as those who were in it. It threw a blight over the whole place, and made the river look foul and poisonous, and the opposite bank, with its protrusion of long-necked chimneys, unsightly gasometers, and deposits of rubbish, wear the aspect of a region at whose expense the jail had been populated. She looked up at the dull, closed gates, tightening her grasp of Hyacinth's small hand, 
and if it was hard to believe anything so blind and deaf and closely fastened would relax itself to let her in, there was a dreadful premonitory sinking of the heart attached to the idea of its taking the same trouble to let her out. As she hung back, murmuring vague ejaculations, at the very goal of her journey, an incident occurred which fanned all her scruples and reluctances into life again. The child suddenly jerked his hand out of her own, and placing it behind him in the clutch of the other, said to her respectfully but resolutely, while he planted himself at a considerable distance, "'I don't like this place.' "'Neither do I like it, my darling,' cried the dressmaker pitifully. "'Oh, if you knew how little!' then we will go away. I won't go in." She would have embraced this proposition with alacrity, if it had not become very vivid to her while she stood there, in the midst of her shrinking, that behind those sullen walls the mother who bore him was even then counting the minutes. She was alive in that huge dark tomb, and it seemed to Miss Pinsent that they had already entered into relation with her. They were near her, and she knew it. In a few minutes she would taste the cup of the only mercy, except the reprieve from hanging, she had known since her fall. A few, a very few minutes would do it, and it seemed to Miss Vincent that if she should fail of her charity now, the watches of the night in Lomax Place would be haunted with remorse, perhaps even with something worse. There was something inside that waited and listened something that would burst with an awful sound, a shriek or a curse, if she were to lead the boy away. She looked into his pale face for a moment, perfectly conscious that it would be vain for her to take the tone of command. Besides, that would have seemed to her shocking. She had another inspiration, and she said to him in a manner in which she had had occasion to speak before, "'The reason why we have come is only to be kind. If we are kind, we shan't mind its being disagreeable. "'Why should we be kind if she's a bad woman?' Hyacinth inquired. "'She must be very low. I don't want to know her.' "'Hush, hush!' groaned poor Amanda, edging toward him with clasped hands. "'She is not bad now. It has all been washed away. It has all been expiated.' "'What's expiated?' asked the child, while she almost kneeled down in the dust catching him to her bosom. "'It's when you have suffered terribly, suffered so much that it has made you good again. Has she suffered very much? For years and years, and now she is dying. It proves she is very good now, that she should want to see us. Do you mean because we are good?' Hyacinth went on, probing the matter in a way that made his companion quiver, and gazing away from her very seriously across the river at the dreary waste of Battersea. "'We shall be good if we are pitiful, if we make an effort,' said the dressmaker, seeming to look up at him rather than down. "'But if she is dying, I don't want to see any one die.' Miss Pinsent was bewildered, but she rejoined desperately, "'If we go to her, perhaps she won't. Maybe we shall save her.' He transferred his remarkable little eyes eyes which always appeared to her to belong to a person older than herself, to her face. And then he inquired, "'Why should I save her if I don't like her?' "'If she likes you, that will be good enough.' At this Miss Pinsent began to see that he was moved. "'Will she like me very much?' "'More, much more than any one.' "'More than you now?' "'Oh,' said Amanda quickly, I mean more than she likes any one." Hyacinth had slipped his hands into the pockets of his scanty knickerbockers, and with his legs slightly apart he looked from his companion back to the immense dreary jail. A great deal to Miss Pinson's sense depended on that moment. "'Oh, well,' he said at last, "'I'll just step in.' "'Deary, dearie,' the dressmaker murmured to herself as they crossed the bare semicircle which separated the gateway from the unfrequented street. She exerted herself to pull the bell, which seemed to her terribly big and stiff, and while she waited again for the consequences of this effort, the boy broke out abruptly. "'How can she like me so much if she doesn't know me?' 
Miss Pinsent wished the gate would open before an answer to this question should become imperative. But the people within were a long time arriving, and their delay gave Hyacinth an opportunity to repeat it. So the dressmaker rejoined, seizing the first pretext that came into her head. It's because of the little baby she had of old, was also named Hyacinth. That's a queer reason, the boy murmured, staring across again at the Battersea shore. A moment afterwards they found themselves in a vast interior dimness, with a grinding of keys and bolts going on behind them. Hereupon Miss Pinson gave herself up to an overruling providence, and she remembered later no circumstance of what happened to her until the great person of Mrs. Bowerbank loomed before her in the narrowness of a strange dark corridor. She only had a confused impression of being surrounded with high black walls, whose inner face was more dreadful than the other, the one that overlooked the river, of passing through grey stony courts, in some of which dreadful figures, scarcely female, in hideous brown misfitting uniforms and perfect frights of hoods, were marching round in a circle, of squeezing up steep unlighted staircases at the heels of a woman who had taken possession of her at the first stage, and who made incomprehensible remarks to other women, of lumpish aspect, as she saw them erect themselves suddenly and spectrally with dowdy untied bonnets in uncanny corners and recesses of the draughty labyrinth. If the place had seemed cruel to the poor little dressmaker outside, it may be believed that it did not strike her as an abode of mercy while she pursued her tortuous way into the circular shafts of cells, where she had an opportunity of looking at captives through grated peepholes, and of edging past others who had temporarily been turned into the corridors, silent women with fixed eyes who flattened themselves against the stone walls at the brush of the visitor's dress, and whom Miss Pinsent was afraid to glance at. She had never felt so immured, so made sure of. There were walls within walls, and galleries on top of galleries. Even the daylight lost its colour, and you couldn't imagine what a clock it was. Mrs. Bowerbank appeared to have failed her, and that made her feel worse. A panic seized her as she went in regard to the child. On him, too, the horror of the place would have fallen, and she had a sickening prevision that he would have convulsions after they got home. It was a most improper place to have brought him, no matter who had sent for him, and no matter who was dying. The stillness would terrify him, she was sure, the penitential dumbness of the clustered or isolated women. She clasped his hand more tightly, and she felt him keep close to her without speaking a word. At last, in an open doorway, darkened by her ample person, Mrs. Bowerbank revealed herself, and Miss Pinson thought it, afterwards, a sign of her place and power that she should not condescend to apologize for not having appeared till that moment, or to explain why she had not met the bewildered pilgrims near the principal entrance according to her promise. Miss Pinson could not embrace the state of mind of people who didn't apologize, though she vaguely envied and admired it, she herself spending much of her time in making excuses for obnoxious acts she had not committed. Mrs. Bowerbank, however, was not arrogant, she was only massive and muscular, and after she had taken her timorous friends in tow, the dressmaker was able to comfort herself with the reflection that even so masterful a woman couldn't inflict anything gratuitously disagreeable on a person who had made her visit in Lomax Place pass off so pleasantly. It was on the outskirts of the infirmary that she had been hovering, and it was into certain dismal chambers dedicated to sick criminals that she presently ushered her companions. These chambers were naked and grated like all the rest of the place, and caused Miss Pinson to say to herself that it must be a blessing to be ill in such a hole, because you couldn't possibly pick up again, and then your case was simple. Such simplification, however, had for the moment been offered to very few of Florentine's fellow-sufferers 
for only three of the small, stiff beds were occupied, occupied by white-faced women in tight, sordid caps, on whom the stale, ugly room, the sallow light itself, seemed to rest without pity. Mrs. Bowerbank discreetly paid no attention whatever to Hyacinth. She only said to Miss Pinsent, with her hoarse directness, "'You'll find her very low. She wouldn't have waited another day.' and she guided them, through a still further door, to the smallest room of all, where there were but three beds placed in a row. Miss Pinson's frightened eyes rather faltered than inquired, but she became aware that a woman was lying on the middle bed, and that her face was turned toward the door. Mrs. Bowerbank led the way straight up to her, and, giving a business-like pat to her pillow, looked invitation and encouragement to the visitors, who clung together not far within the threshold. Their conductress reminded them that very few minutes were allowed them, and that they had better not dawdle them away, whereupon, as the boy still hung back, the little dressmaker advanced alone, looking at the sick woman with what courage she could muster. It seemed to her that she was approaching a perfect stranger, so completely had nine years of prison transformed Florentine. She felt, immediately, that it was a mercy she hadn't told Hyacinth she was pretty, as she used to be, for there was no beauty left in the hollow, bloodless mask that presented itself without a movement. She had told him that the poor woman was good, but she didn't look so, nor, evidently, was he struck with it as he stared back at her across the interval he declined to traverse kept at the same time from retreating by her strange fixed eyes the only portion of all her wasted person in which there was still any appearance of life she looked unnatural to amanda pinsent and terribly old a speechless motionless creature dazed and stupid whereas florentine vivier in the obliterated past had been her idea of personal as distinguished from social brilliancy Above all, she seemed disfigured and ugly, cruelly misrepresented by her coarse cap and short, rough hair. Amanda, as she stood beside her, thought with a sort of scared elation that Hyacinth would never guess that a person in whom there was so little trace of smartness, or of cleverness of any kind, was his mother. At the very most it might occur to him, as Mrs. Bowerbank had suggested, that she was his grandmother. Mrs. Bowerbank seated herself on the further bed, with folded hands, like a monumental timekeeper, and remarked, in the manner of one speaking from a sense of duty, that the poor thing wouldn't get much good of the child unless he showed more confidence. This observation was evidently lost upon the boy. He was too intensely absorbed in watching the prisoner. A chair had been placed at the head of her bed and Miss Pinson sat down without her appearing to notice it. In a moment, however, she lifted her hand a little, pushing it out from under the coverlet, and the dressmaker laid her own hand softly upon it. This gesture elicited no response, but after a little, still gazing at the boy, Florentine murmured, in words no one present was in a position to understand, Dieu de Dieu qu'il est beau! She won't speak nothing but French since she has been so bad. You can't get a natural word out of her, Mrs. Bowerbank said. It used to be so pretty when she spoke English, and so very amusing, Miss Pinsent ventured to announce, with a feeble attempt to brighten up the scene. I suppose she has forgotten it all. She may well have forgotten it. She never gave her tongue much exercise. There was little enough trouble to keep her from chattering, Mrs. Bowerbank rejoined, giving a twitch to the prisoner's counterpane. Miss Pinson settled it a little on the other side, and considered in the same train that this separation of language was indeed a mercy, for how could it ever come into her small companion's head that he was the offspring of a person who couldn't so much as say good morning to him? She felt at the same time that the scene might have been somewhat less painful if they had been able to communicate with the object of their compassion. As it was, they had too much the air of having been brought together simply to look at each other, and there was a gruesome awkwardness in that, considering the delicacy of Florentine's position. 
not indeed that she looked much at her old comrade it was as if she were conscious of miss pinson's being there and would have been glad to thank her for it glad even to examine her for her own sake and see what change for her too the horrible years had brought but felt more than this that she had but the thinnest pulse of energy left and that not a moment that could still be of use to her was too much to take in her child she took him in with all the glazed entreaty of her eyes quite giving up his poor little protectress who evidently would have to take her gratitude for granted hyacinth on his side after some moments of embarrassing silence there was nothing audible but mrs bowerbank's breathing had satisfied himself and he turned about to look for a place of patience while miss pinson should finish her business which as yet made so little show he appeared not to wish to leave the room altogether as that would be a confession of a vanquished spirit but to take some attitude that should express his complete disapproval of the unpleasant situation he was not in sympathy and he could not have made it more clear than by the way he presently went and placed himself on a low stool in a corner near the door by which they had entered est-il possible mon dieu qu'il soit gentil comme ça his mother moaned just above her breath we are very glad you should have cared that they look after you so well said miss pinsent confusedly at random feeling first that hyacinth's coldness was perhaps excessive and his scepticism too marked and then that allusions to the way the poor woman was looked after were not exactly happy they didn't matter however for she evidently heard nothing giving no sign of interest even when mrs bowerbank in a tone between a desire to make the interview more lively and an idea of showing that she knew how to treat the young referred herself to the little boy is there nothing the little gentleman would like to say now to the unfortunate hasn't he any pleasant remark to make to her about his coming so far to see her when she's so sunk it isn't often that children are shown over the place as the little man has been and there's many that would think they were lucky if they could see what he has seen mon pauvre joujou mon pauvre chéri the prisoner went on in her tender tragic whisper he only wants to be very good he always sits that way at home said miss pinsent alarmed at mrs bowerbank's address and hoping there wouldn't be a scene he might have stayed at home then with this wretched person moaning after him miss bowerbank remarked with some sternness she plainly felt that the occasion threatened to be wanting in brilliancy and wished to intimate that though she was to be trusted for discipline she thought they were all getting off too easily i came because pinny brought me hyacinth declared from his low perch i thought at first it would be pleasant but it ain't pleasant i don't like prisons and he placed his little feet on the cross-piece of the stool as if to touch the institution at as few points as possible the woman in bed continued her strange almost whining plaint il ne veut pas s'approcher il a honte de moi there's a many that begin like that laughed mrs bowerbank who was irritated by the boy's contempt for one of her majesty's finest establishments hyacinth's little white face exhibited no confusion he only turned it to the prisoner again and miss pinson felt that some extraordinary dumb exchange of meaning was taking place between them she used to be so elegant she was a fine woman she observed gently and helplessly il a honte de moi il a honte dieu le pardonne florentine vivier went on never moving her eyes she's asking for something in her language i used to know a few words said miss pinson stroking down the bed very nervously who is that woman what does she want hyacinth asked his small clear voice ringing over the dreary room she wants you to come near her she wants to kiss you sir said mrs bowerbank as if it were more than he deserved i won't kiss her pinny said she stole a watch the child answered with resolution oh you dreadful how could you ever cried pinny blushing all over and starting out of her chair 
It was partly Amanda's agitation, perhaps, which, by the jolt it administered, gave an impulse to the sick woman, and partly the penetrating and expressive tone in which Hyacinth announced his repugnance. At any rate, Florentine, in the most unexpected and violent manner, jerked herself up from her pillow, and with dilated eyes and waving hands shrieked out, Ah, quelle infamie! I never stole a watch, I never stole anything, anything! Ah, par exemple! Then she fell back sobbing with the passion that had given her a moment's strength. "'I am sure you needn't put more on her than she has by rights,' said Mrs. Bowerbank with dignity, to the dressmaker, laying a large red hand upon the patient, to keep her in her place. "'Mercy! More! I thought it so much less!' cried Miss Vincent, convulsed with confusion, and jerking herself in a wild tremor from the mother to the child, as if she wished to fling herself upon one for contrition, and upon the other for revenge. "'Il a honte de moi! Il a honte de moi!' Florentine repeated, in the misery of her sobs. "'Dieu de bonté! Quelle horreur!' Miss Pinson dropped on her knees beside the bed, and trying to possess herself of Florentine's hand again, protested with a passion almost equal to that of the prisoner. She felt that her nerves had been screwed up to the snapping point, and now they were all in shreds. That she hadn't meant what she had told the child, that he hadn't understood, that Florentine herself hadn't understood, that she had only said that she had been accused and meant that no one had ever believed it. The Frenchwoman paid no attention to her whatever, and Amanda buried her face in her embarrassment in the side of the hard little prison bed while above the sound of their common lamentation she heard the judicial tones of Mrs. Bowerbank. "'The child is delicate, you might well say. I'm disappointed in the effect. I was in hopes you'd hearten her up. The doctor'll be down on me, of course. So we'll just pass out again. I'm very sorry I made you cry, and you must excuse Pinny. I asked her so many questions.' These words came from close beside the prostrate dressmaker, who, lifting herself quickly, found the little boy had advanced to her elbow, and was taking a nearer view of the mysterious captive. They produced upon the latter an effect even more powerful than his unfortunate speech of a moment before, for she found strength to raise herself partly in her bed again, and to hold out her arms to him with the same thrilling sobs. She was talking still, but she had become quite inarticulate, and Miss Pinsent had but a glimpse of her white-ravaged face, with the hollows of its eyes and the rude crop of its hair. Amanda caught the child with an eagerness almost as great as Florentine's, and drawing him to the head of the bed, pushed him into his mother's arms. "'Kiss her, kiss her, and we'll go home,' she whispered desperately, while they closed about him, and the poor dishonoured head pressed itself against his young cheek. It was a terrible, irresistible embrace, to which Hyacinth submitted with instant patience. Mrs. Bowerbank had tried at first to keep her protégé from rising, evidently wishing to abbreviate the scene. Then, as the child was enfolded, she accepted the situation and gave judicious support from behind, with an eye to clearing the room as soon as this effort should have spent itself. She propped up her patient with a vigorous arm, Miss Pinsent rose from her knees and turned away, and there was a minute's stillness, during which the boy accommodated himself as he might to his strange ordeal. What thoughts were begotten at that moment in his wondering little mind, Miss Pinsent was destined to learn at another time. Before she had faced round to the bed again, she was swept out of the room by Mrs. Bowerbank, who had lowered the prisoner, exhausted, with closed eyes to her pillow, and given Hyacinth a business-like little push, which sent him on in advance. Miss Pinsent went home in a cab. She was so shaken, though she reflected very nervously on getting into it, on the opportunities it would give Hyacinth for the exercise of inquisitorial rites. To her surprise, however, he completely neglected them. He sat in silence, looking out of the window, till they re-entered Lomax Place. End of chapter 3
Chapter Four of the Princess Casamassima by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Well, you'll have to guess my name before I'll tell you. The girl said, with a free laugh, pushing her way into the narrow hall and leaning against the tattered wallpaper, which, representing blocks of marble with bevelled edges in streaks and speckles of black and grey, had not been renewed for years and came back to her out of the past. As Miss Pinson closed the door, seeing her visitor was so resolute, the light filtered in from the street through the narrow, dusty glass above it, and then the very smell and sense of the place returned to Millicent, a kind of musty dimness, with the vision of a small, steep staircase at the end, covered with a strip of oilcloth, which he recognized, and made a little less dark by a window in the bend, you could see it from the hall from which you could almost bump your head against the house behind. Nothing was changed except Miss Pinsent, and, of course, the girl herself. She had noticed, outside, that the sign between the windows had not even been touched up. There was still the same preposterous announcement of fashionable bonnets, as if the poor little dressmaker had the slightest acquaintance with that style of headdress, of which Miss Henning's own knowledge was now so complete. She could see Miss Pinsent was looking at her hat, which was a wonderful composition of flowers and ribbons. Her eyes had travelled up and down Millicent's whole person, but they rested in fascination upon this ornament. The girl had forgotten how small the dressmaker was. She barely came up to her shoulder. She had lost her hair, and wore a cap, which Millicent noticed in return, wondering if that were a specimen of what she thought the fashion. Miss Pinson stared up at her as if she had been six feet high, but she was used to that sort of surprised admiration, being perfectly conscious that she was a magnificent young woman. "'Won't you take me into your shop?' she asked. "'I don't want to order anything. I only want to inquire after your elf. And isn't this rather an awkward place to talk?' She made her way further in, without waiting for permission, seeing that her startled hostess had not yet guessed. The showroom is on the right hand, said Miss Pinsent, with her professional manner, which was intended, evidently, to mark a difference. She spoke as if on the other side, where the horizon was bounded by the partition of the next house, there were labyrinths of apartments. Passing in after her guest, she found the young lady already spread out upon the sofa, the everlasting sofa, in the right-hand corner as you faced the window covered with a light, shrunken shroud of strange yellow stuff, the tinge of which revealed years of washing, and surmounted by a coloured print of Rebecca at the well, balancing in the opposite quarter with a portrait of the Empress of the French, taken from an illustrated newspaper, and framed and glazed in the manner of 1853. Millicent looked about her, asking herself what Miss Pinsent had to show, and acting perfectly the part of the most brilliant figure the place had ever contained. The old implements were there on the table, the pin-cushions and needle-books, the pink measuring-tape with which, as children, she and Hyacinth used to take each other's height, and the same collection of fashion-plates, she could see in a minute, crumpled, sallow, and fly-blown. The little dressmaker bristled, as she used to do, with needles and pins. They were stuck all over the front of her dress. But there were no rustling fabrics tossed in heaps about the room, nothing but the skirt of a shabby dress, it might have been her own, which she was evidently repairing, and had flung upon the table when she came to the door. Miss Henning speedily arrived at the conclusion that her hostess's business had not increased and felt a kind of good-humoured, luxurious scorn of a person who knew so little what was to be got out of London. It was Millicent's belief that she herself was already perfectly acquainted with the resources of the metropolis. "'Now tell me, how is Hyacinth? I should like so much to see him,' she remarked, extending a pair of large, protrusive feet, and supporting herself on the sofa by her hands. "'Hyacinth?' Miss Pinsent repeated, with majestic blankness, as if she had never heard of such a person. She felt that the girl was cruelly, scathingly well-dressed. She couldn't imagine who she was, 
nor with what design she could have presented herself. Perhaps you call him Mr. Robinson to-day. You always wanted him to hold himself so high. But to his face, at any rate, I'll call him as I used to. You see if I don't. "'Bless my soul! You must be the little Enning!' Miss Pinsent exclaimed, planted before her, and going now into every detail. "'Well, I'm glad you have made up your mind. I thought you'd know me directly. I had a call to make in this part, and it came to my Ed to look you up. I don't like to lose sight of old friends.' "'I never knew you—you've improved so,' Miss Pinsent rejoined, with a candour justified by her age and her consciousness of respectability. "'Well, you haven't changed. You were always calling me something horrid.' "'I dare say it doesn't matter to you now, does it?' said the dressmaker, seating herself, but quite unable to take up her work, absorbed as she was in the examination of her visitor. "'Oh, I'm all right now,' Miss Henning replied, with the air of one who had nothing to fear from human judgments. "'You were a pretty child. I never said the contrary to that. But I had no idea you'd turn out like this. You're too tall for a woman,' Miss Pinsent added, much divided between an old prejudice and a new appreciation. "'Well, I enjoy beautiful elf,' said the young lady. "'Everyone thinks I'm twenty. She spoke with a certain artless pride in her bigness and her bloom, and as if to show her development she would have taken off her jacket or let you feel her upper arm. She was very handsome, with a shining, bold, good-natured eye, a fine, free facial oval, an abundance of brown hair, and a smile which showed the whiteness of her teeth. Her head was set upon a fair, strong neck, and her tall young figure was rich in feminine curves. Her gloves, covering her wrists insufficiently, showed the redness of those parts, in the interstices of the numerous silver bracelets that encircled them, and Miss Pinsent made the observation that her hands were not more delicate than her feet. She was not graceful, and even the little dressmaker, whose preference for distinguished forms never deserted her, indulged in the mental reflection that she was common for all her magnificence. But there was something about her indescribably fresh, successful, and satisfying. She was, to her blunt expanded fingertips, a daughter of London, of the crowded streets and hustling traffic of the great city. She had drawn her health and strength from its dingy courts and foggy thoroughfares, and peopled its parks and squares and crescents with her ambitions. It had entered into her blood and her bone, the sound of her voice and the carriage of her head. She understood it by instinct, and loved it with passion. She represented its immense vulgarities and curiosities, its brutality and its knowingness, its good nature and its impudence, and might have figured in an allegorical procession as a kind of glorified townswoman, a nymph of the wilderness of Middlesex, a flower of the accumulated parishes, the genius of urban civilization, the muse of cockneyism. The restrictions under which Miss Pinsent regarded her would have cost the dressmaker some fewer scruples if she had guessed the impression she made upon Millicent, and how the whole place seemed to that prosperous young lady to smell of poverty and failure. Her childish image of Miss Pinsent had represented her as delicate and dainty, with round loops of hair fastened on her temples by combs, and associations of brilliancy arising from the constant manipulation of precious stuffs, tissues at least which Millicent regarded with envy. But the little woman before her was bald and white and pinched. She looked shrunken and sickly and insufficiently nourished. Her small eyes were sharp and suspicious, and her hideous cap did not disguise her meagerness. Miss Henning thanked her stars, as she had often done before, that she had not been obliged to get her living by drudging over needlework year after year in that undiscoverable street in a dismal little room where nothing had been changed for ages. The absence of change had such an exasperating effect upon her vigorous young nature. 
she reflected with complacency upon her good fortune in being attached to a more exciting a more dramatic department of the dressmaking business and noticed that though it was already november there was no fire in the neatly kept grate beneath the chimney-piece on which a design partly architectural partly botanical executed in the hair of miss pinson's parents was flanked by a pair of vases under glass containing muslin flowers if she thought miss pinson's eyes suspicious it must be confessed that this lady felt very much upon her guard in the presence of so unexpected and undesired a reminder of one of the least honourable episodes in the annals of lomax place miss pinson esteemed people in proportion to their success in constituting a family circle in cases that is when the materials were under their hand this success among the various members of the house of henning had been of the scantiest and the domestic broils in the establishment adjacent to her own whose vicissitudes she was able to follow as she sat at her window at work by simply inclining an ear to the thin partition behind her these scenes amid which the crash of crockery and the imprecations of the wounded were frequently audible had long been the scandal of a humble but harmonious neighbourhood mr henning was supposed to occupy a place of confidence in a brush factory while his wife at home occupied herself with the washing and mending of a considerable brood mainly of sons but economy and sobriety and indeed a virtue more important still had never presided at their councils the freedom and frequency of mrs henning's relations with a stove-polisher in the euston road were at least not a secret to a person who lived next door and looked up from her work so often that it was a wonder it was always finished so quickly the little hennings unwashed and unchidden spent most of their time either in pushing each other into the gutter or in running to the public-house at the corner for a pennyworth of gin and the borrowing propensities of their elders were a theme for exclamation there was no object of personal or domestic use which mrs henning had not at one time or another endeavoured to elicit from the dressmaker beginning with a mattress on an occasion when she was about to take to her bed for a considerable period and ending with a flannel petticoat and a pewter teapot lomax place had eventually from its over-peeping windows and doorways been present at the seizure by a long-suffering landlord of the chattels of this interesting family and at the ejectment of a whole insolvent group who departed in a straggling jeering unabashed cynical manner carrying with them but little of the sympathy of the street millicent whose childish intimacy with hyacinth robinson miss pinsent had always viewed with a vague anxiety she thought the girl a nasty little thing and was afraid she would teach the innocent orphan low ways millicent with her luxuriant tresses her precocious beauty her staring mocking manner on the doorstep was at this time twelve years of age she vanished with her vanishing companions lomax place saw them turn the corner and return to its occupations with a conviction that they would make shipwreck on the outer reefs but neither spar nor splinter floated back to their former haunts and they were engulfed altogether in the fathomless deeps of the town miss pinson drew a long breath it was her conviction that none of them would come to any good and millicent the least of all when therefore this young lady reappeared with all the signs of accomplished survival she could not fail to ask herself whether under a specious seeming the phenomenon did not simply represent the triumph of vice she was alarmed but she would have given her silver thimble to know the girl's history and between her alarm and her curiosity she passed an uncomfortable half-hour she felt that the familiar mysterious creature was playing with her revenging herself for former animadversions for having been snubbed and miscalled by a peering little spinster who now could make no figure beside her if it was not the triumph of vice 
it was at least the triumph of impertinence as well as of youth health and a greater acquaintance with the art of dress than miss pinson could boast for all her ridiculous signboards she perceived or she believed she perceived that millicent wanted to scare her to make her think she had come after hyacinth that she wished to inveigle to corrupt him i should be sorry to impute to miss henning any motive more complicated than the desire to amuse herself of a saturday afternoon by a ramble which her vigorous legs had no occasion to deprecate but it must be confessed that when it occurred to her that miss pinsent regarded her as a ravening wolf and her early playmate as an unspotted lamb she laughed out in her hostess's anxious face irrelevantly and good-humouredly without deigning to explain but what indeed had she come for if she had not come after hyacinth it was not for love of the dressmaker's pretty ways she remembered the boy and some of their tender passages and in the wantonness of her full-blown freedom her attachment also to any tolerable pretext for wandering through the streets of london and gazing into shop windows she had said to herself that she would dedicate an afternoon to the pleasures of memory would revisit the scenes of her childhood she considered that her childhood had ended with the departure of her family from lomax place if the tenants of that obscure locality never learned what their banished fellows went through millicent retained a deep impression of those horrible intermediate years the family as a family had gone downhill to the very bottom and in her humbler moments millicent sometimes wondered what lucky star had checked her own descent and indeed enabled her to mount the slope again in her humbler moments i say for as a general thing she was provided with an explanation of any good fortune that might befall her what was more natural than that a girl should do well when she was at once so handsome and so clever millicent thought with compassion of the young persons whom a niggardly fate had endowed with only one of these advantages she was good-natured but she had no idea of gratifying miss pinson's curiosity it seemed to her quite a sufficient kindness to stimulate it she told the dressmaker that she had a high position at a great haberdasher's in the neighbourhood of buckingham palace she was in the department for jackets and mantles she put on all these articles to show them off to the customers and on her person they appeared to such advantage that nothing she took up ever failed to go off miss pinson could imagine from this how highly her services were prized she had had a splendid offer from another establishment in oxford street and she was just thinking whether she should accept it we have to be beautifully dressed but i don't care because i like to look nice she remarked to her hostess who at the end of half an hour very grave behind the clumsy glasses which she had been obliged to wear of late years seemed still not to know what to make of her on the subject of her family of her history during the interval that was to be accounted for the girl was large and vague and miss pinson saw that the domestic circle had not even a shadow of sanctity for her she stood on her own feet and she stood very firm her staying so long her remaining over the half-hour proved to the dressmaker that she had come for hyacinth for poor amanda gave her as little information as was decent told her nothing that would encourage or attract she simply mentioned that mr robinson she was careful to speak of him in that manner had given his attention to bookbinding and had served an apprenticeship at an establishment where they turned out the best work of that kind that was to be found in london a bookbindery laws said miss henning do you mean they get them up for the shops well i always thought he would have something to do with books then she added but i didn't think he would ever follow a trade a trade cried miss pinson you should hear mr robinson speak of it he considers it one of the fine arts millicent smiled as if she knew how people often considered things and remarked that very likely it was tidy comfortable work but she couldn't believe there was much to be seen in it perhaps you will say there is more than there is here she went on finding at last an effect of irritation of reprehension 
an implication of aggressive respectability in the image of the patient dressmaker sitting for so many years in her close brown little den with the foggy familiarities of lomax place on the other side of the pane millicent liked to think that she herself was strong and she was not strong enough for that this allusion to her shrunken industry seemed to miss pinsent very cruel but she reflected that it was natural one should be insulted if one talked to a vulgar girl she judged this young lady in the manner of a person who was not vulgar herself and if there was a difference between them she was right in feeling it to be in her favour miss pinsent's cut as i have intimated was not truly fashionable and in the application of gimp and the distribution of ornament she was not to be trusted but morally she had the best taste in the world i haven't so much work as i used to have if that's what you mean my eyes are not so good and my health has failed with advancing years i know not to what extent millicent was touched by the dignity of this admission but she replied without embarrassment that what miss pinsent wanted was a smart young assistant some nice girl with a pretty taste who would brighten up the business and give her new ideas i can see you have got the same old ones always i can tell by the way you have stuck the braid on that dress and she directed a poke of her neat little umbrella to the drapery in the dressmaker's lap she continued to patronize and exasperate her and to offer her consolation and encouragement with the heaviest hand that had ever been applied to miss pinson's sensitive surface poor amanda ended by gazing at her as if she were a public performer of some kind a ballad singer or a conjurer and went so far as to ask herself whether the hussy could be in her own mind the nice girl who was to regild the tarnished sign miss pinsent had had assistance in the past she had even once for a few months had a forewoman and some of these damsels had been precious specimens whose misdemeanours lived vividly in her memory never all the same in her worst hour of delusion had she trusted her interests to such an extravagant baggage as this she was quickly reassured as to millicent's own views perceiving more and more that she was a tremendous high flyer who required a much larger field of action than the musty bower she now honoured heaven only knew why with her presence miss pinsent held her tongue as she always did when the sorrow of her life had been touched the thought of the slow inexorable decline on which she had entered that day nearly ten years before when her hesitations and scruples resolved themselves into a hideous mistake the deep conviction of error on that unspeakably important occasion had ached and throbbed within her ever since like an incurable disease she had sown in her boy's mind the seeds of shame and rancour she had made him conscious of his stigma of his exquisitely vulnerable spot and condemned him to know that for him the sun would never shine as it shone for most others by the time he was sixteen years old she had learned or believed she had learned the judgment he had passed upon her and at that period she had lived through a series of horrible months an ordeal in which every element of her old prosperity perished she cried her eyes out on coming to a sense of her aberration blinded and weakened herself with weeping so that for a moment it seemed as if she should never be able to touch a needle again she lost all interest in her work and that artistic imagination which had always been her pride deserted her together with the reputation of keeping the tidiest lodgings in lomax place a couple of commercial gentlemen and a welsh plumber of religious tendencies who for several years had made her establishment their home withdrew their patronage on the ground that the airing of her beds was not what it used to be and disseminated cruelly this injurious legend she ceased to notice or to care how sleeves were worn and on the question of flounces and gores her mind was a blank she fell into a grievous stability and then into a long low languid fever 
during which Hyacinth tended her with a devotion which only made the wrong she had done him seem more bitter, and in which, so soon as she was able to hold up her head a little, Mr. Vetch came and sat with her through the dull hours of convalescence. She had re-established to a certain extent, after a while, her connection, so far as the letting of her rooms was concerned, from the other department of her activity, the tide had ebbed apparently for ever, but nothing was the same again, and she knew it was the beginning of the end. So it had gone on, and she watched the end approach. She felt it was very near indeed, when a child she had seen playing in the gutters came to flaunt it over her in silk and lace. She gave a low, inaudible sigh of relief, when at last Millicent got up and stood before her, smoothing the glossy cylinder of her umbrella. "'Mind you give my love to Hyacinth,' the girl said, with an assurance which showed all her insensibility to tacit protests. "'I don't care if you do guess that if I have stopped so long, it was in the hope he would be dropping in to his tea. You can tell him I sat an hour on purpose, if you like. There's no shame in my wanting to see my little friend.' He may know I call him that, Millicent continued, with her showroom laugh, as Miss Pinsent judged it to be, conferring these permissions successively, as if they were great indulgences. Do give him my love, and tell him I hope he'll come and see me. I see you won't tell him anything. I don't know what you're afraid of, but I'll leave my card for him all the same. She drew forth a little bright-coloured pocket-book, and it was with amazement that Miss Pinson saw her extract from it a morsel of engraved pasteboard. So monstrous did it seem that one of the squalid little Hennings should have lived to display this emblem of social consideration. Millicent enjoyed the effect she produced, as she laid the card on the table, and gave another ringing peal of merriment at the sight of her hostess's half-angry, half-astonished look. "'What do you think I want to do with him?' I could swallow him at a single bite," she cried. Poor Amanda gave no second glance at the document on the table, though she had perceived it contained in the corner her visitor's address, which Millicent had amused herself ingeniously with not mentioning. She only got up, laying down her work with a trembling hand, so that she should be able to see Miss Henningwell out of the house. You needn't think I shall put myself out to keep him in the dark. I shall certainly tell him you have been here, and exactly how you strike me. Of course you'll say something nasty, like you used to when I was a child. You let me have it then, you know. Ah, well, said Miss Pinsent, nettled at being reminded of an acerbity which the girl's present development caused to appear ridiculously ineffectual. You are very different now when I think what you've come from. What I've come from? Millicent threw back her head, and opened her eyes very wide, while all her feathers and ribbons nodded. "'Did you want me to stick fast in this low place for the rest of my days? You have had it to stay in yourself, so you might speak civilly of it.' She coloured and raised her voice, and looked magnificent in her scorn. "'And pray, what have you come from yourself, and what has he come from?' the mysterious Mr. Robinson, that used to be such a puzzle to the whole place? I thought perhaps I might clear it up, but you haven't told me that yet." Miss Pinson turned straight away, covering her ears with her hands. "'I have nothing to tell you. Leave my room! Leave my house!' she cried with a trembling voice. End of chapter 4《Chapter V of the Princess Casamassima》by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was in this way that the dressmaker failed either to see or hear the opening of the door of the room, which obeyed a slow, apparently cautious impulse given it from the hall, and revealed the figure of a young man standing there with a short pipe in his teeth. There was something in his face which immediately told Millicent Henning that he had heard, outside, her last resounding tones. He entered as if, young as he was, he knew that when women were squabbling, men were not called upon to be headlong, 
and evidently wondered who the dressmaker's brilliant adversary might be she recognized on the instant her old playmate and without reflection confusion or diplomacy in the fullness of her vulgarity and sociability she exclaimed in no lower pitch gracious hyacinth robinson is that your form miss pinson turned round in a flash but kept silent then very white and trembling took up her work again and seated herself in her window hyacinth robinson stood standing then he blushed all over he knew who she was but he didn't say so he only asked in a voice which struck the girl as quite different from the old one the one in which he used to tell her she was beastly tiresome is it of me you were speaking just now when i asked where you had come from that was because we erred you in the all said mellicent smiling i suppose you have come from your work you used to live in the place you always wanted to kiss me the young man remarked with an effort not to show all the surprise and agitation that he felt didn't she live in the place pinny pinny for all answer fixed a pair of strange pleading eyes upon him and millicent broke out with her recurrent laugh in which the dressmaker had been right in discovering the note of affectation do you want to know what you look like you look for all the world like a little frenchman don't he look like a little frenchman miss pinson she went on as if she were on the best possible terms with the mistress of the establishment hyacinth exchanged a look with that afflicted woman he saw something in her face which he knew very well by this time and the sight of which always gave him an odd perverse unholy satisfaction it seemed to say that she prostrated herself that she did penance in the dust that she was his to trample upon to spit upon he did neither of these things but she was constantly offering herself and her permanent humility her perpetual abjection was a sort of counter irritant to the soreness lodged in his own heart for ever which had often made him cry with rage at night in his little room under the roof pinny meant that to-day as a matter of course and she could only especially mean it in the presence of miss henning's remark about his looking like a frenchman he knew he looked like a frenchman he had often been told so before and a large part of the time he felt like one like one of those he had read about in michelet and carlyle he had picked up the french tongue with the most extraordinary facility with the aid of one of his mates a refugee from paris in the workroom and of a second-hand dog's-eared dictionary bought for a shilling in the brompton road in one of his interminable restless melancholy moody yet all observant strolls through london he spoke it as he believed as if by instinct caught the accent the gesture the movement of eyebrow and shoulder so that if it should become necessary in certain contingencies that he should pass for a foreigner he had an idea that he might do so triumphantly once he could borrow a blouse he had never seen a blouse in his life but he knew exactly the form and colour of such a garment and how it was worn what these contingencies might be which should compel him to assume the disguise of a person of a social station lower still than his own hyacinth would not for the world have mentioned to you but as they were very present to the mind of our imaginative ingenious youth we shall catch a glimpse of them in the course of a further acquaintance with him at the present moment when there was no question of masquerading it made him blush again that such a note should be struck by a loud laughing handsome girl who came back out of his past there was more in pinny's weak eyes now than her usual profession there was a dumb intimation almost as pathetic as the other that if he cared to let her off easily he would not detain their terrible visitor very long he had no wish to do that he kept the door open on purpose he didn't enjoy talking to girls under pinny's eyes and he could see that this one had every disposition to talk so without responding to her observation about his appearance he said not knowing exactly what to say have you come back to live in the place heaven forbid i should ever do that cried miss henning with genuine emotion i have to live near the establishment in which i'm employed and what establishment is that now the young man asked 
gaining confidence and perceiving in detail how handsome she was. He hadn't roamed about London for nothing, and he knew that when a girl was so handsome as that, a jocular tone of address, a pleasing freedom, was de rigueur. So, he added, is it the bull and gate, or the elephant and castle? A public house? Well, you haven't got the politeness of a Frenchman, at all events. Her good nature had come back to her perfectly, and her resentment of his imputation of her looking like a barmaid, a blousy beauty who handled pewter, was tempered by her more and more curious consideration of Hyacinth's form. He was exceedingly rum, but this quality took her fancy and since he remembered so well that she had been fond of kissing him, in their early days she would have liked to say to him that she stood prepared to repeat this form of attention. But she reminded herself in time that her line should be, religiously, the ladylike, and she was content to exclaim simply, I don't care what a man looks like so long as he's clever, that's the form I like. Miss Pinsent had promised herself the satisfaction of taking no further notice of her brilliant invader, but the temptation was great to expose her to Hyacinth as a mitigation of her brilliancy by remarking sarcastically, according to opportunity, Miss Enning wouldn't live in Lomax Place for the world. She thinks it too abominably low. So it is. It's a beastly hole, said the young man. The poor dressmaker's little dart fell to the ground, and Millicent exclaimed jovially, Right you are, while she directed to the object of her childhood's admiration a smile that put him more and more at his ease. Don't you suppose I'm clever, he asked, planted before her with his little legs slightly apart, while with his hands behind him he made the open door waver to and fro. You, oh, I don't care whether you are or not, said Millicent Henning and Hyacinth was at any rate quick-witted enough to see what she meant by that. If she meant he was so good-looking that he might pass on this score alone, her judgment was conceivable, though many women would strongly have dissented from it. He was as small as he had threatened, he had never got his growth, and she could easily see that he was not what she at least would call strong. His bones were small, his chest was narrow, his complexion pale, his whole figure almost childishly slight, and Millicent perceived afterward that he had a very delicate hand, the hand, as she said to herself, of a gentleman. What she liked was his face, and something jaunty and entertaining, almost theatrical, in his whole little person. Miss Henning was not acquainted with any member of the dramatic profession, but she supposed, vaguely, that that was the way an actor would look in private life. Hyacinth's features were perfect. His eyes, large and much divided, had as their usual expression a kind of witty candour, and a small, soft, fair moustache disposed itself upon his upper lip in a way that made him look as if he were smiling, even when his heart was heavy. The waves of his dense, fine hair clustered round a forehead which was high enough to suggest remarkable things and Miss Henning had observed that when he first appeared he wore his little soft circular hat in a way that left these frontal locks very visible. He was dressed in an old brown velveteen jacket, and wore exactly the bright-coloured necktie which Miss Pinson's quick fingers used of old to shape out of hoarded remnants of silk and muslin. He was shabby and work-stained, but the observant eye would have noted an idea in his dress. His appearance was plainly not a matter of indifference to himself, and a painter, not of the heroic, would have liked to make a sketch of him. There was something exotic about him, and yet, with his sharp young face, destitute of bloom, but not of sweetness, and a certain conscious cockneyism which pervaded him, he was as strikingly as Millicent, in her own degree, a product of the London streets and the London air. He looked both ingenuous and slightly wasted, amused, amusing, and indefinably sad. Women had always found him touching, yet he made them, so they had repeatedly assured him, die of laughing. "'I think you had better shut the door,' said Miss Pinsent, 
meaning that he had better shut their departing visitor out. "'Did you come here on purpose to see us?' Hyacinth asked, not heeding this injunction, of which he divined the spirit, and wishing the girl would take her leave, so that he might go out again with her. He should like talking with her much better away from Pinny, who evidently was ready to stick a bodkin into her, for reasons he perfectly understood. He had seen plenty of them before, Pinny's reasons, even where girls were concerned who were not nearly so good-looking as this one. She was always in a fearful funk about some woman getting hold of him, and persuading him to make a marriage beneath his station. His station! Poor Hyacinth had often asked himself, and Miss Pinsent, what it could possibly be. He had thought of it bitterly enough, and wondered how in the world he could marry beneath it. He would never marry at all. To that his mind was absolutely made up. He would never hand on to another the burden which had made his own young spirit so intolerably sore, the inheritance which had darkened the whole threshold of his manhood. All the more reason why he should have his compensation. Why, if the soft society of women was to be enjoyed on other terms, he should cultivate it with a bold, free mind. I thought I would just give a look at the old shop. I had an engagement not far off, Millicent said. But I wouldn't have believed any one who had told me I should find you just where I left you. We needed you to look after us, Miss Pinsent exclaimed irrepressibly. Oh, you're such a swell yourself, Hyacinth observed, without heeding the dressmaker. None of your impudence. I'm as good a girl as there is in London. And to corroborate this, Miss Henning went on, if you were to offer to see me a part of the way home, I should tell you I don't knock about that way with gentlemen. I'll go with you as far as you like, Hyacinth replied simply, as if he knew how to treat that sort of speech. Well, it's only because I knew you as a baby. And they went out together, Hyacinth careful not to look at poor Penny at all. He felt her glaring whitely and tearfully at him, out of her dim corner. It had by this time grown too dusky to work without a lamp, and his companion giving her an outrageously friendly nod of farewell over her shoulder. It was a long walk from Lomax Place to the quarter of the town in which, to be near the haberdashers in the Buckingham Palace Road, Miss Henning occupied a modest back room. But the influences of the hour were such as to make the excursion very agreeable to our young man, who liked the streets at all times, but especially at nightfall, in the autumn, of a Saturday, when, in the vulgar districts, the smaller shops and open-air industries were doubly active, and big clumsy torches flared and smoked over hand-carts and costermongers' barrows, drawn up in the gutters. Hyacinth had roamed through the great city since he was an urchin but his imagination had never ceased to be stirred by the preparations for Sunday that went on in the evening among the toilers and spinners, his brothers and sisters, and he lost himself in all the quickened crowding and pushing and staring at lighted windows and chaffering at the stalls of fishmongers and hucksters. He liked the people who looked as if they had got their week's wage and were prepared to lay it out discreetly and even those whose use of it would plainly be extravagant and intemperate, and best of all, who evidently hadn't received it at all, and who wandered about disinterestedly, vaguely, with their hands in empty pockets, watching others make their bargains and fill their satchels, or staring at the striated sides of bacon, at the golden cubes and triangles of cheese, at the graceful festoons of sausage, in the most brilliant of the windows. He liked the reflection of the lamps on the wet pavements, the feeling and smell of the carboniferous London damp, the way the winter fog blurred and suffused the whole place, made it seem bigger and more crowded, produced halos and dim radiations, trickles and evaporations, on the plates of glass. He moved in the midst of these impressions this evening, but he enjoyed them in silence with an attention taken up mainly by his companion, and pleased to be already so intimate with the young lady whom people turned round to look at. She herself affected to speak with the rush and crush 
of the week's end with disgust. She said she liked the streets, but she liked the respectable ones. She couldn't abide the smell of fish, and the whole place seemed full of it, so that she hoped they would soon get into the Edgware Road, towards which they tended, and which was a proper street for a lady. To Hyacinth she appeared to have no connection with the long-haired little girl who, in Lomax Place years before, was always hugging a smutty doll and courting his society. She was like a stranger, a new acquaintance, and he observed her curiously, wondering by what transitions she had reached her present pitch. She enlightened him but little on this point, though she talked a great deal on a variety of subjects, and mentioned to him her habits, her aspirations, her likes and dislikes. The latter were very numerous. She was tremendously particular, difficult to please, he could see that, and she assured him that she never put up with anything a moment after it had ceased to be agreeable to her. Especially was she particular about gentlemen's society, and she made it plain that a young fellow who wanted to have anything to say to her must be in receipt of wages amounting at the least to fifty shillings a week. Hyacinth told her he didn't earn that as yet, and she remarked again that she made an exception for him because she knew all about him, or if not all, at least a great deal, and he could see that her good nature was equal to her beauty. She made such an exception that when, after they were moving down the Edgware Road, which had still the brightness of late closing but with more nobleness, he proposed that she should enter a coffee-house with him and take something. He could hardly tell himself afterwards what brought him to this point. She acceded without a demur, without a demur even on the ground of his slender earnings. Slender as they were, Hyacinth had them in his pocket. They had been destined in some degree for Penny, and he felt equal to the occasion. Millicent partook profusely of tea and bread and butter, with a relish of raspberry jam, and thought the place most comfortable, though he himself, after finding himself ensconced, was visited by doubts as to its respectability, suggested among other things by photographs on the walls of young ladies in tights. Hyacinth himself was hungry. He had not yet had his tea, but he was too excited, too preoccupied to eat. The situation made him restless and gave him palpitations. It seemed to be the beginning of something new. He had never yet stood even a glass of beer to a girl of Millicent's stamp, a girl who rustled and glittered and smelt of musk, and if she should turn out as jolly a specimen of the sex as she seemed, it might make a great difference in his leisure hours, in his evenings, which were often very dull. That it would also make a difference in his savings. He was under a pledge to Penny and to Mr. Vetch to put by something every week. It didn't concern him for the moment to reflect, and indeed, though he thought it odious and insufferable to be poor, the ways and means of becoming rich had hitherto not greatly occupied him. He knew what Millicent's age must be, but felt, nevertheless, as if she were older, much older than himself. She appeared to know so much about London and about life, and this made it still more of a sensation to be entertaining her like a young swell. He thought of it, too, in connection with the question of the respectability of the establishment. If this element was deficient, she would perceive it as soon as he, and very likely it would be a part of the general initiation she had given him an impression of, that she shouldn't mind it so long as the tea was strong and the bread and butter thick. She described to him what had passed between Miss Pinsent and herself. She didn't call her Penny, and he was glad, for he wouldn't have liked it, before he came in, and let him know that she should never dare to come to the place again, as his mother would tear her eyes out. Then she checked herself. Of course, she ain't your mother. How stupid I am! I keep forgetting. Hyacinth had long since convinced himself that he had acquired a manner with which he could meet illusions of this kind. He had had, first and last, so many opportunities to practice it. Therefore he looked at his companion very steadily while he said, "'My mother died many years ago. She was a great invalid. But Penny has been awfully good to me.' "'My mother's dead, too,' Miss Henning remarked. "'She died very suddenly. 
I dare say you remember her in the place. Then, while Hyacinth disengaged from the past the wavering figure of Mrs. Henning, of whom he mainly remembered that she used to strike him as dirty, the girl added, smiling, but with more sentiment, "'But I have had no pinny.' "'You look as if you could take care of yourself.' "'Well, I'm very confiding,' said Millicent Henning. Then she asked what had become of Mr. Vetch. "'We used to say that if Miss Pinsent was your mamma, he was your papa. In our family we used to call him Miss Pinsent's young man.' "'He's her young man still,' Hyacinth said. "'He's our best friend, or supposed to be. He got me the place I'm in now. He lives by his fiddle, as he used to do.' Millicent looked a little at her companion, after which she remarked, "'I should have thought he would have got you a place at his theatre.' "'At his theatre? That would have been no use. I don't play any instrument.' "'I don't mean in the orchestra, you gabby. You would look very nice in a fancy costume.' She had her elbows on the table, and her shoulders lifted, in an attitude of extreme familiarity. He was on the point of replying that he didn't care for fancy costumes, he wished to go through life in his own character, but he checked himself with the reflection that this was exactly what, apparently, he was destined not to do. His own character? He was to cover that up as carefully as possible. He was to go through life in a mask, in a borrowed mantle. He was to be, every day and every hour, an actor. Suddenly, with the utmost irrelevance, Miss Henning inquired, Is Miss Pinson some relation? What gave her any right over you? Hyacinth had an answer ready for this question. He had determined to say, as he had several times said before, Miss Pinson is an old friend of my family. My mother was very fond of her, and she was very fond of my mother. He repeated the formula now, looking at Millicent, with the same inscrutable calmness, as he fancied, though what he would have liked to say to her would have been that his mother was none of her business. But she was too handsome to talk that way to, and she presented her large fair face to him across the table, with an air of solicitation to be cosy and comfortable. There were things in his heart, and a torment, and a hidden passion in his life, which he should be glad enough to lay open to some woman. He believed that perhaps this would be the cure ultimately, that in return for something he might drop, syllable by syllable, into a listening feminine ear, certain other words would be spoken to him which would make his pain for ever less sharp. But what woman could he trust? What ear would be safe? The answer was not in this loud, fresh, laughing creature whose sympathy couldn't have had the fineness he was looking for, since her curiosity was vulgar. Hyacinth objected to the vulgar as much as Miss Pinsent herself. In this respect she had long since discovered that he was after her own heart. He had not taken up the subject of Mrs. Henning's death. He felt himself incapable of inquiring about that lady, and had no desire for knowledge of Millicent's relationships. Moreover, he always suffered the sickness, when people began to hover about the question of his origin, the reasons why Pinny had had the care of him from a baby. Mrs. Henning had been untidy, but at least her daughter could speak of her. Mr. Vetch has changed his lodgings. He moved out of number 17 three years ago, he said, to vary the topic. He couldn't stand the other people in the house. There was a man that played the accordion. Millicent, however, was but moderately interested in this anecdote, and she wanted to know why people should like Mr. Vetch's fiddle any better. Then she added, "'And I think that while he was about it, he might have put you into something better than a bookbinder's.' "'He wasn't obliged to put me into anything. It's a very good place.' "'All the same, it isn't where I should have looked to find you,' Millicent declared, not so much in the tone of wishing to pay him a compliment as of resentment at having miscalculated. "'Where should you have looked to find me? In the House of Commons? It's a pity you couldn't have told me in advance what you would have liked me to be.' She looked at him over her cup while she drank in several sips. "'Do you know what they used to say in the place? That your father was a lord?' "'Very likely. That's the kind of rot they talk in that precious hole,' the young man said, without blenching. 
"'Well, perhaps he was,' Millicent ventured. "'He may have been a prince, for all the good has done me.' "'Fancy your talking as if you didn't know,' said Millicent. "'Finish your tea. Don't mind how I talk.' "'Well, you have got a temper,' the girl exclaimed archly. "'I should have thought you'd be a clerk at a banker's. "'Do they select them for their tempers?' "'You know what I mean. You used to be too clever to follow a trade.' "'Well, I'm not clever enough to live on air.' "'You might be, really, for all the tea you drink. Why didn't you go in for some high profession?' "'How was I to go in? Who the devil was to help me?' Hyacinth inquired, with a certain vibration. "'Haven't you got any relations?' said Millicent, after a moment. "'What are you doing? Are you trying to make me swagger?' When he spoke sharply, she only laughed, not in the least ruffled and by the way she looked at him seemed to like it. "'Well, I'm sorry you're only a journeyman,' she went on, pushing away her cup. "'So am I,' Hyacinth rejoined, but he called for the bill as if he had been an employer of labour. Then, while it was being brought, he remarked to his companion that he didn't believe she had an idea of what his work was and how charming it could be. "'Yes, I get up books for the shops,' he said when she had retorted that she perfectly understood. But the art of the binder is an exquisite art. So Miss Pinson told me. She said you had some samples at home. I should like to see them. You wouldn't know how good they are, said Hyacinth, smiling. He expected that she would exclaim in answer that he was an impudent wretch, and for a moment she seemed to be on the point of doing so. But the words changed on her lips, and she replied almost tenderly, "'That's just the way you used to speak to me, years ago in the place. "'I don't care about that. I hate all that time.' "'Oh, so do I, if you come to that,' said Millicent, as if she could rise to any breadth of view. And then she returned to her idea that he had not done himself justice. "'You used always to be reading. I never thought you would work with your aunts.' This seemed to irritate him, and having paid the bill, and given threepence ostentatiously to the young woman with a languid manner and hair of an unnatural yellow, who had waited on them, he said, "'You may depend upon it, I shan't do it an hour longer than I can help.' "'What will you do then?' "'Oh, you'll see, some day.' In the street, after they had begun to walk again, he went on, "'You speak as if I could have my pick.' What was an obscure little beggar to do, buried in a squalid corner of London, under a million of idiots? I had no help, no influence, no acquaintance of any kind with professional people, and no means of getting at them. I had to do something. I couldn't go on living on Pinny. Thank God I help her now, a little. I took what I could get. He spoke as if he had been touched by the imputation of having derogated. Millicent seemed to imply that he defended himself successfully when she said, "'You express yourself like a gentleman,' a speech to which he made no response. But he began to talk again afterwards, and, the evening having definitely set in, his companion took his arm for the rest of the way home. By the time he reached her door he had confided to her that, in secret, he wrote. He had a dream of literary distinction. This appeared to impress her, and she branched off to remark, with an irrelevance that characterized her, that she didn't care anything about a man's family if she liked the man himself. She thought families were played out. Hyacinth wished she would leave his alone, and while they lingered in front of her house, before she went in, he said, "'I have no doubt you're a jolly girl, and I am very happy to have seen you again, but you have awfully little tact.' I have little tact? You should see me work off an old jacket." He was silent a moment, standing before her with his hands in his pockets. "'It's a good job you're so handsome.' Millicent didn't blush at this compliment, and probably didn't understand all it conveyed, but she looked into his eyes a while with a smile that showed her teeth, and then said, more inconsequently than ever, "'Come now, who are you?' Who am I? I'm a wretched little bookbinder. I didn't think I could ever fancy anyone in that line, Miss Henning exclaimed. 
Then she let him know that she couldn't ask him in, as she made it a point not to receive gentlemen, but she didn't mind if she took another walk with him, and she didn't care if she met him somewhere, if it were handy. As she lived so far from Lomax Place, she didn't care if she met him halfway. So, in the dusky by-street in Pimlico, before separating, they took a casual tryst, the most interesting, the young man felt, that had yet been, he could scarcely call it, granted him. End of chapter 5